cataractcoach.com podcast series episode number 54 with Bill Wiley, a passion for training the next generation of cataract refractive surgeons in the full spectrum of refractive surgery. Welcome back to our Cataract Coach podcast and today we have an amazing refractive and cataract surgeon Dr. Bill Wiley from Cleveland, Ohio here in the USA. I've known Bill and actually before that even your dad when he was in practice with you for gosh it's been at least two decades. Hence, we both have a good amount of gray hair. We're going to talk about a lot of things, like the future of what is coming in refractive surgery, and also how you can get your skills up to game so you're ready to go, and stuff you may not learn in residency. So, Bill, welcome to our podcast. Yeah, thanks, Udi. You know, huge honor to be on uh, the podcast with you. I love all the stuff you're putting out there, and uh, as we're discussing, the amount of work you've put and the amount of content you've put out there is just amazing, and I always learn from you. And uh, all you know, uh, all my fellows always learn from you, and and uh, the young docs have so many good things to say. So thanks for what you do for our field. It's so cool to be on this uh, podcast with you. No, of course we're all learning together. In fact, I've been a big fan of you. Have a whole new series on Instagram that I find so useful. So tell uh, me a little bit about that. How'd you get started, and and what's your kind of goal with the Instagram? Yeah, you know, so with Instagram, you know, what I've realized is. Um, you know, it, it started with working with some of the uh, young docs that uh, are on my team. We have this um, fellowship that uh, we're, you know, sort of a mentorship fellowship. We're teaching uh, docs uh, refractive and cataract surgery. And what I've realized is, you know, we've had now eight fellows. And every year, you know, we, I find myself teaching the same things over and over. Maybe something simple like, uh, a capsule rexus or a chopping technique or whatever it might be. And every year we kind of start from scratch and uh, teach them the same things. I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, you know what, should we have some kind of library of content to put this out there? And I, you know, learn from you sort of, you know, all my fellows, you'll watch what you do in Cataract Coach and you've been such a great uh, teacher. And I thought to myself, you know what, I should start to build this library. Uh, and if it, if, if at the very least, just the fellows in my, uh, program, um, watch it. I, I'm winning, but if anybody else can learn from it, that you know, that's great as well. So, if you know, um, if if a young fellow has watched all all the content that's out there and and, and joins our team, they're going to be that much further ahead if they've practiced it right. within the residency. And so, in my mind, it's just kind of helping raise that bar for uh, for for skill sets that are out there, and uh, and then the next fellow is going to kind of build on that and build on that. And, you know, I also learn, and I don't know if you're like this, if you can teach something, it makes you that much better at what you do. You know, it's one right. thing to do it, but then to kind of break it down in steps, you're like, okay, well, why do I do it this way? Or why do I do a chop? Mm -hmm. this way? For sure. And then when you break it down, you're like, oh, wait a minute. Now that's made me a better surgeon, but also I've hopefully raised the bar for other docs that are out there trying to learn the same thing. Yeah, you have to absolutely master something to be able to teach it. And yeah. I'm like you, the more I make a video, I'm like, I'll learn a lot about it. So I'll kind of do a little extra homework to make sure I'm saying anything wrong. Yeah. So I, I learn more than I than I teach. I'm like, I'm absorbing all those good stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Exactly. I, I've um, thought about it over the years and, you know, I've become, um, it's, you know, I thought I was pretty good. Um already but over the you know over the past you know seven eight years I've, I've gotten that much better as a surgeon um you know sometimes people will ask me they'll say you know what you know dr wiley uh how long would it take to become let's say a world-class lasik surgeon and i say you know what i could probably get you to become world-class within maybe four five six months maybe a year something like that and i say okay they, well what about a cataract surgeon how long does it become to, did it take to become a world-class cataract surgeon and i usually answer i say you know what I'll tell you when I get there. And right. uh, yeah, you know, because, you know, right. You know, we're always trying, it's like, you think you're good and then you, 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 you there's another level. And so you, you, you try to lay, right. raise it up. You know, yeah. I always say cataract surgery. It'll take you many years to learn it and a lifetime to master it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah, Honestly. It's, it's anything. And yeah, I mean, we pick up so many more pearls. I think this, the cell phone has really changed the way that we're learning. Yeah. And so you learn so much. I mean, I learn best visually. I think all ophthalmologists do, and we're in the field. 
Yes. But to be able to watch just a little bit of a video every day, just pick up pearls here and there. It's just, wow, the, the, the learning is just immense. And that little bit of learning over the course of a year, amazing. Totally agree. You're right. And uh, you think back to when we first learned, you know, cataract surgery, you, know, we, you might have watched, you might have had like a, a, a VHS tape and plugged in a VCR and watched that. And that was, you know, pretty good, but you could only, yeah, I don't know. It's sort of a production to put something on, uh, on the TV to watch it. And then even you, you would say, okay, well, I'm going to go to a meeting and watch somebody teach something. And, and, you know, it, you might go to a meeting once or twice a year, Academy or ACRS or whatever it might be, maybe a special meeting, uh, Caribbean and I, you know, obviously, you know, I'm biased towards that meeting. It's a meeting I've been going to a long time, but you learn a little bit, but it's broken out. But now on a cell phone, literally it's right there at your fingertips. Uh, and you can learn that much faster. And I'm curious, I don't know if, if you've gotten the new uh, Apple Vision Pro, but I'm wondering with that type of uh, device, are we gonna be that much more immersed? You know, uh, I've been, we, we uh, my son and I got one and we've been messing around with it. And just, I can only imagine if we can sort of immerse ourselves that much more into let's say 3D cataract surgery and it might feel like we're actually there in the room. I don't know if that's gonna be the case or not, but they're gonna, you know, again, one more level up of uh, digital, you know, uh, yeah, you know peer -peer yeah. education. Yeah, I have not tried it yet. I mean, I've seen like the the, the thing on, online about it. Yes. I'd certainly love to check it out. But yeah, there's a, I think the most common, I track all this. So I yeah. I had a few 3D videos that featured on Cataract Coach, but the views were really low. And it's kind of like 3D TVs at home. Like, you know, yeah. 10 years ago, I'd go to Costco or Best Buy and it's all 3D TVs. And now, yeah. there's literally zero. If I go to Costco or now, there's not, they don't sell a single 3D TV. That's interesting. You're right. You know, it's funny you say that. I, you know, working with the guys over at True Vision that ultimately then transitioned into Ingenuity, they were talking about when they when they built it. Um, initially, they can get off the shelf 3D TVs at Best Buy for a couple thousand dollars, and it would go with their system. And towards the tail end, they were like, well, you know what? They no longer make 3D TVs. And I think they had to like actually produce them, you know, work with a factory and have these custom made. And now some became like $20,000 to get a TV set because they were the only ones making it. And uh, and it's interesting, just sort of the um, sort of the commercial market that's out there, you know, consumer market versus com commercial market. And it's just interesting how you know, this divergence and intertwining and obviously, you know, the, the cell phone, it's going to be hard to beat what we can see on these, you know. Uh, right, the convenience too. Right, right. Yeah. Like while I make, I may make my videos on a desktop or a laptop, I think they're consumed. I, have, I track all this. They're consumed way more than half on mobile devices. So if the uh, cell phones and tablets are kind of looped together in the, in the, in, in the demo. Yeah. yeah, but desktops, laptops are, are a smaller percentage. That's so interesting. Now, um, so so you're tracking. You can see, you know, uh, where, you know, basically where these you know devices are, you know, you know how they're being, you know, how your content right. consumed. Right. So right, right. Um, yeah. So you can track all that stuff. Plus, you know, the question is, do you do landscape mode or are you doing portrait mode? And uh, so, if, if, if it's a lot of it's in your hand, a lot of like Instagram is always portrait mode, not landscape mode. But YouTube is port is, is landscape mode. I'm kind of biased towards landscape mode because that's how we record the videos in the first place. Ah, uh, that's interesting. That's interesting. And then sort of probably depending who the target audience is and how you know are, is are you seeing more people on YouTube or more people on Instagram or it probably depends on the content too. If is it a you know, 90 second pearl, or is it a five minute case or discussion? You know what right. I mean? It's probably, or, or are you kind of bouncing back? Yeah, between for Cataract Coach, I put up a full five minute plus video every single day. And then what I do, I copy a clip of that, uh, maybe half of it to Instagram for the Instagram account. Yes. And so, but then, yeah, I, I, I cross post on everything. So on Facebook, okay. LinkedIn, Instagram, cataractcoach.com, the website on, on YouTube. It's all immediately done. And I do it, at, the videos go out at 2 a.m. Pacific time, which is 5 a.m. East Coast time. So my East Coast surgeons can enjoy it in the morning when they're having their coffee or their commute to work or whatever. That's awesome. That's so cool. That's so cool. And how far, how far ahead are you producing? Let's say 
do you have a calendar and are you keyed up for next week already or are you yes oh, yes oh, weeks in advance or days in advance or months in advance you know, typically no no so months in advance is tough because i want to stay current you right know, one of the neat things with, with the way we do things now is honestly i'm not a huge fan of putting stuff in the old peer review journals anymore and the reason is yes it's it's respected and this but that's kind of old school you know how if i put a video up of me operating tomorrow five thousand ophthalmologists will peer review it the same day yes uh, it's amazing yeah it, you know the power it, yeah you're right it, i i've kind of we've seen this transition and and i suppose all this you know i don't know what your thoughts are are we seeing uh the media is it sort of additive to what's already been built or is it replacing when i say that so you have old school peer review and if you think of an idea yeah and gather the data it might be a year before it gets into print and then you have let's say a meeting oh like academy areas arrest you know there's some peer reviewing and going on there it might take six months to get it out there caribbean eye let's call it three months and then maybe a uh a, a throwaway journal like uh crst or i world or something like that maybe it's a month or two but instagram is the day or the minute and so do you think that all this the newer stuff is it replacing all let's say peer review going all the way back to the beginning or is it just sort of additive like you need these other and this is just more to support is it just the uh the pie getting bigger or is it you know uh or is it taking away pieces of the other pie if you had to guess i'm wondering what your thoughts are that's a great question and so i think it's i think it is a little bit of a shift especially yeah. now because i know in my own clinic for the trade journals that come on my desk actually my staff just throws them away yeah so i don't actually read them and even the ones like i have a monthly column ocular surgery news even the one that has my picture on the on the they're throwing it away i'm not saving any of them because how much how much can i save right it's too much so and i don't so i don't i i don't think i hardly ever look at the at the trade journals that come on my desk everything's yeah. only consumed for me online desktop laptop or or cell phone or tablet that's how it's done and i think but i even was a fan of this 20 years ago in 2004 yeah. when the when when the 25 gauge vitrectomy systems first came out i actually had an idea that i did with our pediatric ophthalmologists we were both attending level junior attendings young guys me and federico velez who's a fantastic peds person in la we decided to use 25 gauge vitrectomy to do a baby lensectomy no way. back in the day the, the babies with the congenital cataracts they were making these nonsense huge incisions and these are my, minuscule eyes these are like nine millimeter white to whites so we did the whole thing 25 years because we even a fake it right for the first year or so of life yeah and they were, they were in the, the contact that changes every month so i wanted it out there immediately so what i did was i got it published as my column in, in osn occupational news the next month so beat everyone to the punch. Yes, it's not peer review and this and that, but at least yeah. it's there. It's documented that was done at that time. So I think videos now replace that. And right. So it's, it's that much quicker. Yeah. Right. Just that much quicker. And I think now the, the, the key in all this stuff is just to make sure that it's in, you can index it and search it. And one of the catches and the problems with Instagram is if you do a Google search, how many Instagram results does Google pull up? Yeah. Very, very few. But yeah. since Google owns YouTube, a ton of you put it on youtube it's always prioritized in a google search yeah that's a good point so you've got to make sure you've get that you know you know sort of redundancy and so you want that you want it to hit you know i suppose both and, and they're both serving a purpose you know right. you know one you know is you're getting into as as you know the you know, younger docs or yeah i guess every doc now is sort of getting their daily feed on their instagram but also the indexing when you do a Google, you know, uh, and if you're you, obviously you have memberships where if you're a membership, you're going to get, you're going to get lit up that, you know, there's a new video that dropped, you know, Ketter coach. And so right. there's a lot of different ways to get that out there. But I think, uh, yeah, you're definitely touching. You know, I, I started seeing some of the shift change when people talk about a lot of times it would be even um, industry reps would come in. They'd say, Hey, did you see the new, video you know uh uday's new video or paul singh's new video or maybe morgan micheletti these are a few people that ha are kind of putting video out there and it, it was interesting it was, and i'd be like no like what what, what what is this on or were they talking you know you know what medium and it was interesting i was like well gosh it used to be did you see the new 
you know, uh, issue that came out that, uh, you know, OSN or whatever it might be and that, you know, dropped in there. It, and it's like, okay, I'd look at that. But now industry is pushing, you know, this content because they realize, you know, it's the best way for the, uh, for docs to learn and uh, it's, or the current way currently. And so I just, I sort of realized, I'm like, gosh, if I want to be relevant or stay relevant, you know, I, I, uh, I've got things to say and I've got techniques to put out there, fellows to train or whatever it might be. And it, it's, this is going to be my, you know, I, I better get involved, you know. Right. I think, I think the same way. And then again, it's just putting out so much good information there. So I've created a whole bunch of stuff, not only a video every day now for 2,100 something. Amazing. Days. I can't, I, that's yeah. so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but now obviously the, pod, the podcast is going now. We're uh, yeah. about a year into it, which is fantastic. And the podcast is just growing very rapidly. But I also have a free cataract coach PDF book about learning cataract surgery. Forget buying a book anymore. It's a PDF file. Download it, send it to your friends. It's free. Share it with everyone. I don't, I don't mind. And then I also have a 25-part curriculum series. So 40-minute videos about lesson one, preparing mentally for the operating room, lesson two, and ergonomics, setting up the patient. I got a whole lesson about different types of anesthesia, whether it's a topical or intercameral, sub block or retrobulbar block, perivalve. I have videos for all that stuff. So I have a complete 25 part curriculum series, which if you do a video that's longer, 40 minutes, a video every week, you can get yes. that done in 25 weeks or half six months, or you do it every other week, get it done in a year. And so that's I awesome. put all that out there free too. Yeah, so so Udi, when do you sleep? Yo, when yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just, you know, it's it's all, yeah, it's a ton of work. You gotta be driven, you gotta, you gotta be motivated to do it. But yeah, my videos, I'm about a month ahead in, my, in the queue, I keep them in a queue. Again, I yes. don't wanna be too much more than that, because okay. then if someone sends me a great video, why well, can't put it up? But I already have them all lined up for the next two months, three months. That's too much. Got it. So you so, got to juggle. Maybe you maybe like you're moving, but you might you know, move things around or shift it or something. Right. And then even though this is all digital, all this, some old habits die hard. You yeah. know what that is? Gown card, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. List of videos that I'm for the month that I'm doing. No way. I love that. I love when people reuse it. Yeah, you know, gallon cards. Yeah, you know, I had uh, some some OR staffs like collect collect those and they have it. They're like, okay, this is what I use for notes around the house or whatever it might be. I love it. Right. So I so I I use these to make a list of like here. I, I don't I don't give it to but those are like here some of the February videos already done. Like there you go. No way. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There's some secret sauce. I love it. Yeah. I put a little checkbox there when I got it upload. I'm obviously you can do it all digital, but like you know that's that's something I picked up in med school 30 years ago. That's so cool. So, That's so yeah, cool. but a month in advance is probably the sweet spot for me, and then also allows me to be able to travel. Yeah, like I can go to a meeting. I did. I did. Gosh, I did twelve countries last year. So I really get making the making the rounds on the traveling for ophthalmology. Oh my gosh! Right. Yeah. It's it's yeah. yeah. It's a ton. It's a ton. Yeah. But it's it's amazing to go see people, and well, I'm just so flattered when people. I, I literally take in every meeting. I take hundreds of selfies, and I'm so yeah. honored. And and I and I've witnessed that you're not just saying I've been at meetings with you, and uh, I've seen yeah you know, I've, I've sat next you know I just like if I happen to be on podium near you I know I'm gonna get some shrapnel there's this sort of it, there's gonna be some spillover you know like you know I'm gonna get put I might get tagged in some uh, uh, you know pictures with Uday but I've seen the docs and it's interesting it's a lot of the young docs because that's who's you know really in this medium. Uh, and uh, I've seen people come up, get your autograph, the whole thing. So uh, it's you know, fun. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's really funny. You know, I mean, I'm I'm happy that it, my 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 family's always thought I was a little crazy. Like, why are you so into this one surgery? Why do you why are you cuckoo for cataracts? I said, well, I just this is what I love. Yeah. I just love this surgery. Yeah. And so now it's like I'm so me so happy that other people share that passion, and like, oh my gosh, they want to learn from these videos. I'm honored. Yeah, that's so cool. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. And then the neat thing is, like, we can get things that are fresh and new. And, like, you know, Sergio Canabrava is an amazing surgeon from Brazil, has, an, has a way of doing his Canabrava technique of, of basically kind of suspending a lens with proline and flanges and all that. So he just sent me an updated new version. He's got a, a revision to it. I'm like, sweet. I'm happy to put up a cataract coach. And, I, and the amazing part is, in the first day, it'll get 5,000 views. It's like, just, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, and so it just disseminates that information so that he can let everyone know, hey, here's the new way I'm doing it. Yeah, it really is just, I think, yeah, and even though we do skew younger, I think majority of my audience is, let's say, under age 50, surgeons under age 50. Yeah. You'd be yeah. surprised that a lot of surgeons are over age 50. 
who, who, who watched my stuff. I just uh, interviewed for a podcast. Uh, the podcast just recently is Johnny Gayton. That uh, Johnny Gayton such an incredible man. I love that guy. Yeah, yeah I love him. Incredible. So, but he was like, he watches all my videos. He's still, yeah. I, I'm honored. Uh, I that's so, him, right? That's he, so, like, he, he invented like piggyback <laughs> lens and, and you know, uh, um, IOLs to treat narrow yeah. angles. I mean, like. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. His, yeah, his studies, you know, on piggyback back lens, you know, we, we still reference him. Uh, you know, we just uh, published something. Uh, Arjun Hura, who's out near uh, neck right. of the woods, did a series on uh, piggyback lenses at our office and looking at acrylic on acrylic and sort of, you know, debunking some of the myths that were out there. And and, and, and I said, well, just, you know, look up for the references, look up Johnny Guyton. And he had, you know, you know, article after article, you know, you know, yeah. and basically helped, you know, create that, uh, that space and, you know, did a lot of heavy, heavy lifting there. Now, now I know it's a side tangent, but now you got to tell me what, what were the secret findings? Or the okay, myths so, that were yeah, so, yeah. So, so here's the thing. So what's interesting, you know, there's been a, a, you know, a myth and I think it was built on some truth, but, uh, that you can't put acrylic on top of acrylic in a piggyback, uh, formation, but we've found, we've been doing that for, years i had a we had about uh i think a 30 i k series that we tracked with uh, acrylic in the sulcus on top of a, an acrylic that's in the bag and the key is as long as you have one in the bag and one in the sulcus you're okay it's sort of if you put acrylic and acrylic in the bag you're going to get interlenticular fibrosis uh that's really hard to treat because you can't yag it it gets trapped in between the lenses but if you have one lens in the bag and one in the sulcus in particular you need a certain lens in the sulcus we use the ar40 that has rounded edges so it's not irritating the iris not causing this inflammation so if you have rounded edge optic uh with uh, proline haptic uh in the uh sulcus you, you tend to do okay so i think a lot of people were afraid to put that acrylic in the uh in the sulcus they're like oh we're gonna have a problem um but it was based on sort of data it was both cool. lenses bag so anyways a little side note so now people should feel comfortable putting the acrylic lens but what where it all started was you know star used to make a great lens that went into the sulcus uh everybody used it and then they discontinued it and uh yeah. and stars lens was silicone uh or column or one of the two anyways uh and then when that went off the market people were like okay well now what are you using for piggyback cool. and uh, they're afraid to use the acrylic but actually you can uh if it's in the sulcus yeah, I'm with you. Bring back the Star AQ 2010. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I can't remember the model number. Yeah. <laughs> that was an awesome lens. Yeah, because it's a little yeah. bit bigger. Overall, ha haptic lens is a little longer. And then the optic thing was like 6'3 or something. So a little that's bit right. bigger. So, it was, yeah, it was forgiving. You, it would cover that old, you know, the, the, the base lens, no problem. Yeah, no, it's pr pretty cool stuff. So, yeah. you know, speaking of it, so you, this is a study you did with a former fellow. You've got yeah. an amazing fellowship that we definitely got to talk about. Ah, Your fellowship is, I think, the it's a refractive surgery fellowship that is really incredible volume, incredible teaching. Tell me about it. Ah, uh, thanks, Eddie. Yeah, so it's interesting. It actually, you know, it, it seems to have this driving force. We train surgeons in Ohio, and they go to California. That's yeah. kind of <laughs> they're all here. <laughs> so, so actually, yes, yeah, so I know if you're in, in your backyard, but actually, so it started with uh, uh, Amir Marafi, uh, who's who's out in LA and great great doc and. He was training here in Ohio at uh, uh, Case Western, and uh, and I work with some of the residents over there. And so one day he said, "Hey, Dr. Wiley, can I come by and just see what you're doing uh, in clinic in a private clinic?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, no problem. Come anytime." So he comes in, and yeah, you take it for granted, as you know. You know, and, and academics often runs at a little bit different pace, and they have you know maybe some different priorities than what a private practice cataract practice a cataract refractive practice is doing so he came in he's like oh my gosh he's like seeing a lot of cool and innovative stuff that we are sort of taking for granted and he said you know dr wiley this is like been the greatest day i've had in you know in ophthalmology i think he's buttering him up a little bit but he gives me a big hug and you know hugs me at the beginning of the day and hugs me at the end of the day if you know uh, amir he's a big hugger he hugs everybody and so he's like you know, would you at all be interested in doing a fellowship? I'd love to train under you for, for a year. And we've been thinking about it, but it's so hard to find that first fellow because mm -hmm. the first one is critical. If, if they're not into it or if, if they don't have a good experience, then you're not going to get that next one or the next one. So he was very highly motivated and we we're already sort of thinking about having the fellowship. And um, so we said, okay, yeah, Amir, we'll take you on. Uh, so he was psyched. And then 
the next year he did a great job of telling friends out there and uh, said, you know, this is a great fellowship that you're, you're going to learn a lot and it's relatively high volume and, uh, and then it sort of grew from there, but we do have your sort of a philosophy. Yeah. I, I sort of took it back to how did I learn? And there's a few different ways people learn. And, and there's a lot of different ways. I, I tell uh, docs, you know, you should sort of find a mentor that is like style where you're going to learn and, and maybe, more didactic and you know in the classroom and more academic i say okay great go that path or some people say you know what i need hands-on i yep. need you know surgical yes exactly and say okay and that's how i learned when i uh trained under my father i i didn't do a formal fellowship per se i was i joined my dad and he he did more of a mentorship and he said okay bill you know you're the goal is he had this thought he's like if you can do a thousand procedures in a year by the by the end of that year you're going to have you know near expertise in that procedure almost that um oh, i'm going to blank on the uh it's malcolm is it gladwell the the author that wrote the book blink but uh talked about becoming an expert you know the the, the speed of doing that uh volume is if you can get to a thousand of a certain you know technique you're going to be that much further ahead so he said okay if you can do a thousand cataracts and a thousand lasik in your first year with me, Bill, I think you can then help take over the practice and I can retire quicker. He is highly motivated to, to retire. <laughs> so he basically, so I said, okay. And it worked, it, that worked for me. I sort of fast tracked my, you know, uh, professional career, you know, into my, in, uh, in, in our practice and said, okay, if I have a fellowship, that's going to be my goal to have, you know, more or less a thousand, you know, you know, lens based procedures and a thousand corneal refractive based re procedures. And we've sort of held true to that. Um, and that's a dang good clip. That's like yeah. 20 LASIK and 20 IOLs a week for, yeah. for a month. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's been sort of the goal. And, and, uh, and, and so, you know, the, you know, docs have then want, you know, our goal, you know, I think, you know, residency, I look at residency, it's, it's so you can become competent in doing a certain, you know, let's say competent in doing, uh, retina lasers. We all learned how to do that or competent in doing cataract surgery, whatever it might be. But, a fellowship, no matter what path you're doing, you know, retina or peds or glaucoma, whatever it is, you the goal should be to become near ex, you know, expertise in that area. And so, hopefully, up, upon graduating a fellowship, you can go to nearly any town, you know, uh, and become one of the best in that town at what you do. Or docs might be like, hey, I'm going to refer to this guy, even though they might be only a year or two out, they become good at that. And so, you know, as you've probably seen, you do. It seems like you know, refractive surgery today. You know, we have so many, when I came out, we just had LASIK and PRK and that was it. And now we right. have, you know, ICLs and corneal cross-linking and CTAC and intacs and, you know, uh, presbyopic lenses and torque lenses and ED, EDOF lenses and light adjustable lenses and all these different things, smile. And, you know, uh, uh, it's hard to be good at all those. You know, we've learned it, you and I, over 20 some years or more yeah. and and uh but now if you want to come out of residency to be good it's it, it takes time you know and takes volume and experience and so we're hopefully trying to have this you know and there's a number of other practices like this that are doing these type of you know uh, uh fellowships where you're trying to learn all the modern techniques within a relatively short period of time maybe some are, some are two years some are one year but uh anyways that's our goal so a fellowship sounds amazing. And I think that's kind of the trend. I had a on the podcast Guy Kazirian, great episode, by the way, who's head yeah. of the Refractive Surgery Alliance. Yes. And he's explaining how there's so many now programs where there are doctors like you and these busy, busy practices who are setting up these fellowships that are unlike anything else like academic ophthalmology has ever seen. Yes. And it really is for refractive surgery kind of breaking out into finally its own subspecialty. Totally agree. And I think, you know, Guy uh, has done a great job, another great educator and, and networker and collaborator. He's, he's got so many cool projects out there. Uh, physician CEO, I, I actually took that uh, a few years ago and had a great experience. And, oh, cool. uh, yeah, yeah. And so Guy, uh, the RSA is, you know, a, a great resource for uh, young or any refractive surgeon, uh, but they do have a great uh, fellowship track. And, um, like you said, it is different. I think I, I some people, I, I, you know, I want to be careful, but I don't want to be, um, you know, competitive necessarily with academic centers. I think it's just a different path. And I often when uh, residents ask me, they say, 
you know, you know, doc, what, what would be, should I do more an academic fellowship or private practice fellowship? And my typical recommendation would be, would, would be to say, try to envision your ideal sort of work life in 10 years. And I say, if you are 15 years, if your path, if you think of the, the perfect setup is to be, let's say a chairman of an ophthalmology department at, uh, at XYZ Academic Center, I said, to be honest, your best path, best path to get to that chairmanship is likely to go through an academic fellowship, understand the hierarchy, understand the different specialties and subspecialties, how they work, how the hospital system works, all the politics, the whole strategy there. I said, you've got to go that path. I don't think taking a Wiley Bofna fellowship is going to help you. It wouldn't, I, I mean, maybe you go with us, but not likely the straightest path to get to your goal. I said, but if you sort of envision, you know what, I want to be in a cataract refractive private practice setting, you know, either, you know, uh, smaller practice or, you know, small group practice with a focused sort of directive on this type of practice style. I think a private practice fellowship is that stepping stone. You get to see right. how does the staff work? How does the administrator work? How do they interface with industry? All those things. So you sort of almost have to take a step back and envision where do you want to go? And then, a practice a fellowship like ours could be a great stepping stone to get to that future goal right now what are some of the challenges you get someone who finished residency and maybe a very good residency who's done 200 ish cataracts yeah. during residency but never once did 20 today because i know when i taught residents of the county hospital when i first started teaching there it was four or five cataracts for the whole day and yeah. at best i was able to achieve by the end very routinely we, we could get 10 cataracts done in eight hours, which for the county hospital was pretty good, especially yeah. with training doctors. But so at most you're gonna get someone who's finished residency and at most did let's say 10 cataracts in a day. And all of a sudden now they gotta do double that volume. How do you get them up to speed? Yeah, so, and I think some people are um, intimidated by that that, that perspective and they, they think, uh, gosh, I don't think I can do or I wanna do that. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I it's easy. I think anybody has that aptitude if they want to do it. Let's say, but we we start slow and break it down, literally step by step. And I more or less look at, you know, even a surgeon. Maybe nowadays, you know, back when I was coming out of residency, if I did 180 cataracts, that was a lot. That was like a busy residency. And they said now there's some doing three, four hundred cases. But I'll be honest, even those high volume residencies, I pretty much assume they're starting from scratch for cataract surgery like right. literally the style i want to just break it down and say okay you've pretty much hasn't haven't done any i'm going to break it down even putting the lid speculum in or draping the patient i said okay let's break like you know you know when we're doing the drape i'm like okay switch that's not quite right go back in readjust it the lid speculum get that step and uh we go you know more or less step by step uh and breaking it down and so we start with maybe just the incision and it's just okay the incision and then you know stop and i'll take over and then we usually start from the beginning of the case and the end of the case and kind of work towards the middle so maybe you work at the incision get that down and at the end of the case injecting the lens and then doing ina relatively straightforward like, i would say the most challenging part and the most risky part is actually nuclear disassembly you know the crack or FACO. So we sort of start at the beginning and the end and work towards that middle. Uh, and even when we you know, get to that middle section, let's say nuclear cracking, maybe I'll chop the, the nucleus into you know, four or five, six pieces and then switch and say, now you can remove them. Oh, get used to the FACO settings, get used to the system, get used to maybe ingenuity, seeing 3D. And then eventually um you 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 start getting through that and i tell you know the, the team you know it might be a couple months before they've even done one cataract with 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 us and and they think well the, and then they start thinking they're like well all those like little incisions and stuff like that does that count towards my case count i said no no until you've actually fakeoed and removed the nucleus or they don't count any of those cases they're like oh my gosh so now we're two or three months in and now you're saying i'm still going to finish with a thousand cases how's this going to go but eventually you know you have to get all those steps uh right before you can you know feel confident with nuclear disassembly and then finally we work on that um and different fellows will move through that 
sort of timeline, you know, at different paces, but uh, more or less, I know, you know, we're highly motivated to get them through that, uh, you know, through that uh, sort of learning curve. How about dealing with patients? Because it's a different setting in that most people who do their training, you're doing it in an academic center, or let's say a county yeah. hospital or a VA hospital, yes. and now you're in like an elective, you know, high-end private practice. How do yeah. you? Well, yeah, so, so there's, functionally no room for it for for error and so you know our philosophy is you know we have to be delivering better care with two doctors than one and so um you know initially my partner and i was saying you know as you know you with a private practice setting you have a, you have a high expectation you have to you have to deliver on that um and you know patients you know any patient has that high demand regardless of where you are but somehow in private practice it seems like the stakes are higher uh there's some competition out there so there's a number of people out there that right. are available to do the same thing you do so so our philosophy is sort of let's say maybe let's say flying an airplane you know you know two pilots are better than one and so you have a pilot and co-pilot and those pilot and co-pilot are doing different you know uh things throughout the uh throughout that that trip but having those two on board that plane is going to allow for safer better you know uh more accurate you know you know flight and and so we have that same philosophy so we have two people working with the patient two people looking at the chart two people studying you know watching the video making sure everything's going perfect so working hand in hand and you know assuring that everything's going to go perfect so we've sort of raised the the bar and have better outcomes right. with this team approach than we would with just a solo you know Oh, I love the idea. I love the the concept of the pilot, pilot and co-pilot. It makes a ton of sense. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So it seems to work out. So, but but it is. I I would say that even today, we're we're better teachers today than we were when we first started. It's just like I'm I'm sure your yeah, first few videos on Cataract Coach were you know were probably good, but but the ones you put out now, like you know how to break it down. You know how to you know it's an art right. to be able to teach something, and right. you it it takes you know it just takes time to even learn how to teach so uh for so sure. got, yeah for sure and another challenge like you were saying if in basketball if you shoot 90 percent from the free throw line you're pretty good yeah <laughs> well i shoot 90 percent cataract surgery you're a disaster disaster so you're right. even 99 is like no it's not good enough right the stakes are so high yes right. it's so amazing i mean just if you think of the, the standard that we hold ourselves to which is basically a hundred percent. Yes, that's right. That's right. It is. Hey, you're right. And it's, you know, it, and I think uh, other fields of medicine have different standards. If you look at, let's say, you know, even OBGYN, it's very challenging field because there are real complications that happen at real percentages. Right. I think the complication rate is, you know, way higher with those types of surgeries than we have with, you know, thankfully with counter surgery, in general in good hands the complication rate is so small but but it's not to say that it's easy it just we want there's just no room for error we've just held it to a higher standard as opposed to the patient right and you know someone has surgery on a different part of the body they're not going to see the surgery or maybe not know its effect so much if i had a yeah. shoulder repaired like okay it's pretty good i don't know the difference but for the vision i i see this every day whether it's my lasik or my cataract <laughs> i mean this is like Wow, the right. stakes are so 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 high. No, it's 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 tough tough to teach all this, but I'm yeah. obviously a fantastic job. That's really neat. But now for your fellows, they go out and obviously do practice and 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 very successful. You've got to recruit your fellows to help you create like a online curriculum for this stuff. Put all put all the you have so much good stuff to put it on to get all the other in a proper curriculum. It'd be amazing. I know. I I feel like. We do have some work to do. You, you, yeah, I got to take a uh, a page out of your book and and work on that and get better at putting the content out there. You know, because you know, we 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 video so many cases. We have so many things that you have know, drawers of hard drives that are sitting there. Right. I'm like, okay, I got to break that down and and really, you know, uh, you know, analyze it and 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 edit it and put it out there. But. Uh, yeah, that, that'll yeah, be. You got, you got so much great stuff to teach, but well, I'm really impressed with that fellowship. It just sounds like you're training them right. Just the way you approach it, the two pilot method, the kind of bookending them into cataract surgery, which I thought was neat. Then getting them such high volume and really teaching them the the intricacies of how the whole practice runs. I think that's 
really, I mean, I wish I did your fellowship uh, 20, 20 some years ago. <laughs> so high yield. Yeah, well, see, yeah, I mean, you should, now, have you thought about doing it yourself? You know, uh, have you thought about having I'll uh, be your fellow anytime you want. I'm pretty good. You'd be surprised. You'd be like, man, he can suck out a cataract vast. Yeah. Clean, safe, <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I think I could just take like a year sabbatical. You know, if you came on board, I would just, you know, take a year off and <laughs> come no, back. You know, I, I did teach resin for a long time, from 2000 yeah. to 2022. So I thought, oh no, I taught, no. taught, taught 10,000 resin cases. And I got so, you. That's where some of the gray hairs came from. I see. Yeah, right? <laughs> oh, I, I love it. I love teaching residents, but it was time to move on past the baton. Yeah. So I stopped doing that in 2022. But I do have a new project in the works, and hopefully later this year I'll be back teaching residents, but at a different kind of setup. So, oh, really? I look yeah, forward. To it. Just, yeah, keep me updated. Yeah, yeah. We, I, I, happy to you know uh, you know discuss or download any other thoughts on the whole process if I can be of any help. But uh, yeah, I'm it's sure. really neat. I mean, you know, probably one of my favorite things of teaching residents was like being in touch with them years, decades later, and so yeah. proud of what they accomplished. Like I go out of my way to help them, like you know, succeed in life. And ah, uh, that's so it, cool. It's that that camaraderie it means a lot. It means it's, uh, just, it it's just yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, you see some of the people, you know, like. Uh, that have done a really good job. You look at, let's say, Dick Lindstrom, who oh, you know, had the Lindstrom Fellowship. And you see, it's so crazy to think that we could name, between you and I, we could probably name 20 of them just right. off like off the cuff. And like the impact that each one of those individuals had on the field is amazing, let alone all of them, let alone just all having a mentor like you know Dick Lindstrom. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Real frustrating. He's one of the godfathers. I mean, yeah. he was my podcast number two. My podcast no number one was Osher. Number two was Lindstrom. I mean, I'm, oh, these guys awesome. are obviously amazing. Huge yeah. impact on, on on all of our careers. So it's really, yeah. really a neat thing. But we we all end up uh, learning together, and those guys are obviously very very passionate. Yeah. Where, sure. where do you, where do you see future the future of refractive cataract surgery? What's coming down the road for us? You're always in the forefront. You work with a lot of companies. You have a lot of the latest technology. You probably you're probably the biggest gadget guy out there. What's uh, coming okay. next? So what's coming next? You know what? It's interesting. I think um, I, I think accommodative lenses might be you know it might have a resurgence. I know yeah. you know it, it, that's what started all the premium you know with the crystal lens, and you know I think that you know paved the way. But uh, for the whole premium channel, guys like Andy Corley, that sort of invented this space that, that, you know, probably without that, you and I wouldn't even be talking right now. You know, our field, I think, would be in so much trouble. With it. be, you know, it's just hard to imagine where we would be without that innovation cycle that was just infused. Yeah. For the uh, young doctors who may not know, Andy Corley was with a company called Ionics that made the crystal lens. And at the time, they risked three of these presbyopic lenses. One was crystal lens from Ionics, which is then sold to Bausch & Lomb. One was a, a multifocal from Alcon, the Restore 4.0. So it was a it was a bifocal with a four diopter on the IOL ad, which is maybe like 3.2 diopters, a spectacle plane ad. And then there was from from um, at the time AMO, which was American Medical Optics, then became Advanced Medical Optics, then became Abbott Medical Optics, and now was sold to Johnson and Johnson. That company had uh, what, what was their lens? The array. They had well, uh, yeah, they. The yeah. Then they had the the resume. That's right. Resume, that's right. resume was a a refractive, not a diffractive multifocal lens. So those are the three lenses. And so what ended up happening was Andy Corley and some very smart people basically petitioned CMS, the Center for Medicare Services, to say, can we allow patients to pay out of pocket for these devices and the associated surgeon fees for that? And in May of two thousand five, they were successful in getting that done. And that has changed. That's 19 years ago. Wow. That has changed our practice forever. So we're obviously eternally grateful. Yeah, it's amazing. You're right. It's, it's crazy. We're coming up. Uh, we'll be coming up on 20 years. We should do celebrate that and acknowledge that. It's a big milestone because um, that 20 years of in innovation, without that, we would have had capitated reimbursement. And so nobody would want to invent any of this new stuff. Nobody would want to have a femtosecond laser to chop up a cataract because they say there's no money to pay for it. Uh, no one would want a new, you know, accommodating lens, multifocal lens, torque lens, any of this stuff, uh, because with a capitated system, there was no money to go around. So now with bounce billing, truly the sky's a limit. If you've invented, 
x-ray lens okay fine it, it, someone will pay for that and there's yeah. an ability to, to do that so um uh so that innovation you know is really helped pave the way so anyway so what's the new i, I think accommodative lenses may come back there's a cool lens uh uh, jealousy that looks like it has, uh, you know, a uh, great accommodation from a, a doc that was actually here in Cleveland, a pediatric ophthalmologist, uh, Jim Ellis, that saw, you know, why could a, a, a kid's lens accommodate 10 diopters when they're, when they're young? And could we re, you know, you know, with, with a new compliant material, allow it to have that happen, uh, you know, you know, you know, with modern day technology. So that looks cool. There's a, another lens called the Atia lens. It's a modular design. It looks cool. So maybe we'll see something like that. There's you got the lens gen juvene too. That's the one that uh, I'm I'm involved in. Oh nice, yes, 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 and yes, <laughs> and the juvene. I, I was I, I always get that one mixed up. So yo, is that is that with uh, uh Ram Rao? Uh, yes, yes, yeah, yes. lens gen. You got it. Yeah. And so so you know, what's interesting is like it just takes so long though. I did I the know. first human implantations of the juvene ever. I did it in 2015. No in way. Oh, I didn't realize that. Oh no way. Oh, that's and awesome. then I did a bunch more later on in Monterey, Mexico, and obviously they're. Now they're now starting FDA trials, but it's like nine years later. Yes, it is. It's it's some heavy arduous, lifting. arduous. So so that's cool. Well, well, thanks, Udi, for for heavy lifting in the early stages. That's where a lot of that uh, stuff happens. So you have all those things, uh, which looks cool. There's um, a small startup, but you know that that looks interesting called On Point that has um, a piggyback style that actually the piggyback clips on to the uh, natural lens. So in theory. You could clip on a multifocal or, or clip on a torque lens or clip on what's also cool they have a high ad clip on that you could do a magnifier for mag uh, macular degeneration so clip on a plus 10 for as on the existing iol yeah so it clips on oh, any oh. IOL. uh and so um that was uh started by uh kevin katie that was uh he might have known him he was at Ionics a long time ago uh, as a rep. I think he started as a rep and then moved his way up. Was at uh, Wave Tech for a bit. I think Star for a bit. Anyways, cool to see sort of kind of like an Andy Corley type. You know, Andy was you know uh, you know you know early lens rep that you know worked his way up to become CEO and, and you know saw how the business worked. And so Kevin uh, looks like uh, he's taking a shot. And that looks very cool. Um, I think what's also interesting is sort of adjustability so the light adjustable lens is very cool so to see what they might do with that technology but exchangeability you know if we're going to have the ability so i think it's going to be i don't know it's going to win is it going to be adjustability exchangeability one of those two things but i think patients nowadays it's sort of like when you have your your iphone this is the iphone 15 well they know that there's going to be an iphone 20 coming out and they want to have the ability to have that why should they be locked in with a lens for lifetime and uh, so, so a lot, I, I, you've probably seen how many patients come in and say, you know what, I want to do something, but it seems so final to just be pick this lens. Mm -hmm. What happens? What if? What if there's new tech? Can I get something new? So things like maybe the Omega capsule that allows yeah. for changeability or some other, you know, uh, some of those new lasers that can adjust actually the lens that's, you know, any lens inside the eye with face Yeah, refractive index shaping. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, is that going to be the future? So who knows? I think. Yo, know, uh, I guess the bottom line, it, it's, I think it's, uh, is every time I think, I remember when I first came out, my dad started LASIK surgery in 98 and I came out in 02 and he had done thousands of LASIK. And I'm like, I thought to myself, I legit thought this. I'm like, I think I missed the boat on refractive surgery. Everybody else, everybody's had refractive surgery. There's going to be nobody left. And you can think right. that was 02 and think about all the innovation that's happened since 02 right. until now. And so we're, you know, docs coming out just now are probably thinking, you know, what, I've missed the boat. There's all the, the you know, everybody's had something and I, I, there's nothing more we can do. But we're just, I think, t scratching the tip of the iceberg. There's going to be another X many years of innovation ahead of us. Absolutely. I think that's probably one of the best bits of advice I'd give to young ophthalmologists is that do not worry about surgical volume. You will have plenty of volume. There is <laughs> so much more need. And we are barely scratching the surface. If you look at the total amount, like in the U.S. now, the instances of myopia keep going, keep, keeps going up and up and up because we're doing all this near work in these formative years. You see now kids in strollers, babies playing on an iPhone. You see <laughs> kids who are you know singular, eight, nine, ten years old, the whole day is on an iPad. It's crazy. Yes. And so as a result, they end up becoming myopic. So the incidence of myopia is super high now. 
And you'll yes. get to some cities, people like Singapore and Hong Kong, where the incidence of myopia is like 80% or more among young people. And yeah. think about LASIK, what are we doing now? Six, seven hundred thousand LASIK for the country as a whole per year? I mean, it, this should be more ubiquitous. It should be like braces. You know, right. you turn 11, 12 years old, your teeth are a little bit crooked, your, your parents get you some braces, your teeth become perfectly straight. It should be the oh. same thing, kind of like, all right, you're, you became myopic in your youth, okay, you, somewhere around college age, right after college, just do your keratinal fracture surgery, stabilize you. Now you're good to become present biopic. When you become yeah. present biopic at age 50, now you can do an eye well, restore your accommodate, and you're good for life. Yes, totally agree. Yes. I, I think we're I think we're gonna get there for sure. So yeah, I would never worry about surgical volume. There I promise there is so much more volume out there that we can even handle. <laughs> totally agree. You you're right. I think it is interesting. I think in the older generations, you you when cataract surgery, well, number one, there wasn't really refractive surgery, RK, but it, you know, that was a very small amount. But then cataract surgery, I think there was in the uh late nineties, I think we had I think 800,000 cataract surgeries done a year, maybe 600,000. And now I think next year it projected 4 million or something like that. So right. it's almost like back then it, people got really competitive with each other. Like, oh my gosh, they're taking my cases. And now it's just sort of, and that's, you know, not to say there's not competition, but now it's more internal competition. Like, okay, how do I, you know, service the patients that are out there and give them the technology that, that they want? How do I educate them? It's more internal competition rather than external competition. It's a weird kind of shift, but I, in some regards, it makes, I think, us, you know, interact with more, you know, uh, look at everybody more as colleagues than competitors. Yeah. It, it, you know, I'm sure, I mean, you're in California, maybe it's a little, it's probably a bit different out there, a little more competitive. Well, you're, but, you're, no, you're right. I, I only compete with myself. Yeah. I have plenty of colleagues, but I don't have any competition in LA because yeah. I'm not competing with them. I'm literally competing with myself. Every case I do, it's like, how perfect can I make it? How, be how beautiful can I make this case? How accurate can I be? How safe can I be? What's the newest technology I can give to this patient? So yeah, I'm competing with myself, not with someone else. So you're right. And there really is no issue with volume. I promise you, wherever you end up, just do great work and it'll take time to get busy. But you'll be plenty busy. I actually now I want to do less surgery, not more. That's that's so true. I think it's a great philosophy. I think patients find the good doctors, no matter what. Like if you just every patient you treat, just try to do the best, you know, get the best possible result. That patient tells two, those two tell two others, and it just becomes exponential. And it's just delivering, you know, you know, on each case that you do. And uh, I think you, you know, you're right. It's a, it's a good way to look at it. Don't worry about the volume. It, it'll be there. Absolutely. Yeah, I tell patients too. I said for this surgery. I'm giving you exactly the treatment that I'd want from you. So you don't have to worry. But I, are you doing this? Are you doing this? I'm using exactly what I'd want from my own eye for every step. That's awesome. So you, I assure you it is the absolute best of the best of the best because that's all I want from my own eyes. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. You're right. Yeah, and, and patience, I think it's, it's such an, an amazing time to be an ophthalmologist. I think it's just, you know, such, such a blessing for us. I'm, a, I'm like you, about the same time. I finished my, my, my residency in 2000, and I, did, uh, I didn't do a formal fellowship either. But as you can see now, I'm still doing a fellowship. I'm doing a lifelong <laughs> fellowship. I'm learning, I learn every day. Right. That's so true. That's so true. So, no, no, all neat stuff. I think where we're heading in our field is going to be amazing. I think... Uh, we're seeing it now for sure. Common lenses, I think, are coming. The adjustability of lenses or, or, or swappability is coming. I, I do like that idea. That's, that makes a lot of sense to me to not be locked in forever. Right. And then I also think we're in the OR. I think we're going to get robotic cataract surgery. I mean, this is common. You're right. There's a, uh, you probably know, I saw uh, the presentation from the guy out in California. Um, yeah. That, yeah. JP, JP Hubschman at Horizon Surgical. Yes. That, so I, I'm actually involved with the company. So uh, that's, that's my deal. Okay. I'm already involved. That's awesome. Well, well, congrats on that. I, 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 if you would have asked me two years ago, I said, there's no way. I just wouldn't believe it. I don't think it would have been possible. And then I saw the presentation and, and had a chance to kind of uh, have a, you know, a Zoom call with, 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 with JP. And, and, and it was, I, I thought, oh my gosh, like I legit started thinking like I might be replaced. I, if I would never have thought I'd be replaced by a robot, but when no, I saw it's that. Like, it's, it's like a plane of autopilot. I mean, you're basically yeah. you can, a surgeon will supervise it. But yes. maybe in the future, a surgeon can supervise. Maybe I can look at a screen and supervise four four robots at once. Totally. Yeah, I think right? it's I think it's possible. I was, 
I never would have thought so, but when I saw the tech, it's sort of sort of like driving, you know, with an autopilot with a you know Tesla. You know, you never yeah. would have thought, you know, you know, now we're doing it. So yeah, and it'll get better and better. I think 10 years from now you'll have a really truly self-driving car. Way yes. better than we have now with even the best Teslas. But I think yeah. it's coming. And the other neat thing too is just like if you think of for, for human vision, I can process 25, maybe 30 frames a second. If yeah. I show you a YouTube video at 25 frames a second, you see it as very fluid. 30 frames a second for sure. 60 frames a second, it's like beyond fluid. It's so perfect. Right. But you can have like real-time devices like OCTs measuring the position of like the poster capsule hundreds of times a second. Yeah. And yeah, so like, and then with a reaction time far faster than a human. Yeah. So, so we should be yeah. It's coming. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's the key. I think it's we're always searching. I, I always say that the, the driving forces for innovation are safety and efficacy. And and you know, we're always trying to get better results and safer results. And if that, you know, robotic is gonna certainly if it can if it can trump on the safety. You know, and just eliminate, you know, capsule tears, you know, complications, you know, and then obviously, you know, things like AI and all that stuff to you know, improve efficacy, you know, just keep driving those things forward. And uh, yeah, I, yeah, I see it's, I see it's the future. You're right. Yeah, especially for routine cases. You know, 90 plus percent of your cases are basically routine. So obviously for the tougher cases with the small pupil with the sneaky and this, maybe that's not quite the robots, you know, wheelhouse just yet. Maybe that's still for you as a surgeon. Right. But I think it's going to be still, we're still in control of it. We're still controlling it. That's I think right. the last kind of pillar we're going to have in the future is obviously integration of more AI stuff. So as you know, I've been involved with AI and lens calcs for a long time now. And I think that's really starting to come to fruition. And we're seeing results that are just, you know, really quite impressive, much better than we've ever had before. So I think those three things, accommodating lenses, I think robotic cataract surgery, and then I think um, AI more involved in ophthalmology is, is what's coming from in my perspective. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. So if, yeah, if you had to bet, those are good horses to bet on for sure. That's what, that's going to lead us forward. Yeah. And then again, we still have that growing population here in the U.S., growing amount of need for our services, and we still have so few residency spots. They used to be like 400 something. Now it's slightly increased to 500 spots nationwide. We just had the ophthalmology match um, last week. Yes. And so it's, uh, I think it's a great time to be an ophthalmologist. And if anything, we need to train more of us. Totally agree. You're right. I, yeah, it's interesting. I think we do have, uh, you know, this looming sort of volume problem that's coming over our head. And, uh, you know, you know, just to see as those baby boomers hit, um, it, at the same time, we're having a number of baby boomers, you know, you know, sort of leave the workforce. We're sort of, I think, I, I, I forget the stat, but it's something like every year we get 500 new ophthalmologists, but I think every year we have like two times or three times that that retire. So it's sort of like, yeah, we're, we're going upside down and the volume's going up. So something's got to give, yeah. Yeah, well, I, would, I think it will become more and more efficient. I think that that'll be an amazing thing. And maybe they'll, ex they'll expand training programs more, but obviously great time to do ophthalmology. And listen, get your... The, the, the Wiley Bofna <laughs> protocol up there for fellowship year and like the curriculum. And the, I'm telling you, it'd be an amazing resource. It'd be so widely, or get together with other, pra other similar practices, maybe yeah. with the RSA and put something together. I think it'd be amazing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, uh, a friend of mine, uh, you know, Rob Weinstock's got a very similar fellowship. And, right. uh, you know, we were just down at Caribbean Eye and he had, uh, I think, eight of his fellows were there at a, you know, a reunion and we had, six of ours there and it was great you know just to see it's amazing so just between two, uh his practice and ours we had you know 15 people of just this generation and you're right like a lot of the knowledge that just we're 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 creating is just sort of word of mouth getting passed down but we've got to put it we got to digitalize it and you know uh put it out there so yeah fantastic. Right, so now we got a good project for you Inspi yeah. inspired by cataract coach i love it yeah, 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 totally. Well, thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. You're thanking me now, but then, then next week when you started this, you were like, oh my gosh, the amount of work. Yeah. This is so much work to do this, but at the it's end, hard. I promise it's all worth it. And that's what you recruit the fellows. They'll help you too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I got to, you know, I've got to be better at delegating some of that. <laughs> exactly. Part of the deal is, all right, you got to do this chapter, this portion, you know, 
yeah, join the team. Yeah. This, is, this is your job here. Yeah. Oh, you'll get it done, I'm sure. Well, Bill, it was a pleasure talking to you. I mean, I've, I've loved being your colleague for 20 years. We kind of think the same way in so many different uh, topics here. And I'm really excited what you're doing with your fellowship and training the next generation and with your new foray into social media. Keep it up. Thanks, Uday. Uh, truly an honor to be on this uh, podcast with you. Uh, and the same to you. I appreciate all the stuff you've done. Uh, yeah, the great content that you're putting out there. You really are making an impact on our field. And so it's great to see it. Great to work with you. And oh, thanks, thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you. And I want to remind our listeners and our viewers, remember, we got a new podcast every single week. It's on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, YouTube. Anywhere you find podcasts, you're going to find it. Just search for Cataract Coach. It'll be there. Also, remember, we got that full curriculum series we talked about on cataractcoach.com. You got to leave YouTube. You got to go to cataractcoach.com. The free PDF book, all the other resources, and, of course, there's still a new video every single day. And we will catch you next time.